In this video, we're going to give another example of a parabolic PDE, namely the Black and Scholes equation. Now, let me give some context here, and let's suppose that I own a company that is doing some business with a foreign entity that is using its own currency to pay me, and they will pay me in one year from now. All right, and you know I have to to build a product and just uh, ship it to them, and in one year. I will get uh, some money, but that will be in their currency. Okay, well, that's interesting, of course. I mean, I'm very happy about this contract, but um, their currency might actually go down. It might go up, which would be a good thing, but it might also go down. And I want to somehow uh, take some kind of an insurance contract, if you want, even though it's not going to be an insurance contract. I want to make sure that I won't lose money out of the deal. So I want to be allowed to... Uh, take this money, this foreign currency, in one year and make sure that I will have uh, the, the, the right to, 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 to convert it to euros at the rate of today. Well, this is something that actually can be done. It's called an option. Uh, and basically what we're saying is that I want to buy a contract that gives me the right to buy, but it could be to sell uh, a stock or a currency or something at a given date T, at a given price, K. So that uh, contract being called an option, uh, in 1970s, 1970s uh, Robert Merton, Fisher Black, and Maren Scholz showed that uh, buying, and, buying and selling just the right way uh, actually allows the bank to remove any risk when actually uh, selling you this contract. So it's not really that they are uh, rolling the dice as well, we think it might go up, it might, no. They actually don't take any risk, and that is uh, by actually using a partial differential equation. So uh, that means actually that this, uh, there is only one unique price, right price, for the option. And then, of course, on top of this uh, right price, you can, of course, uh, have a margin, but th that's, of course, a different story uh, altogether. Okay, here is the equation, actually. Um, with some hypothesis that we're going to discuss in just a minute, uh, we can derive that the, uh, the equation is this equation here. So, what are all these terms and parameters? First, T, capital T, is the date where I want to be able to sell or to buy my stocks or my, my currency or whatnot. Okay, so that's capital T. Small t is the time, uh, and that will be between, obviously, zero, uh, when I sign the contract, and t, when capital T, when I want to use my contract. x of t is the price of the stock or the currency at a given time. K is the price that I want to be able to sell or to buy my, 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 my stock or my currency at time capital T. That is called the strike price. And then U uh, will be the price of the option, which obviously will depend on the price of the stock at time T and the time uh, where we are basically looking at. And what, what happens, obviously, is that if the, 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 the price of the stock or the currency is higher than the strike price, then obviously, uh, uh, you know, when I'm getting paid, I'm not going to use this contract. I'm just going to pocket the money, pocket the difference. I'm like, that's great news. Uh, you know, forget about this option. I'm not going to use it. But if it's below that price, uh, that strike price, now obviously I'm going to go see my banker, say, well, here's my contract. Here is the currency I got from my uh, foreign, uh, I mean, uh, contractor uh, or client, and I, I want, I want my euros. Okay. R is the uh, risk-free interest rate, and sigma is the standard deviation of the stock's return. Now, with all of this, here is the equation we have. Time derivative of u minus one-half of sigma square x square d, I mean, second derivative of u with respect to x square, plus rx du dx minus ru equals zero, with some interesting um, uh, conditions, right? I mean, we talked about boundary conditions and we talked about uh, initial conditions, and this one's quite, quite, quite interesting, quite unusual, I would say. Now, to tell us a little bit more about uh, this, uh, this, this Black and Scholes equation, uh, then I invited a guest star. We have Jan Morazek from Yizeg, which is a uh, business school downtown Paris, 
and he will, he actually wrote several books on the matter, and he is going to tell us a little bit more about the Black and Scholes equation. Jan? Okay, thank you, John, for the kind invitation. So I'm going to discuss about the, uh, the Black Scholes brochure differential equation and its derivation. So let me briefly discuss about the financial environment. So assume that you get one stock and that's the value today, let's say at time zero, is equal to S0, which is equal to 100. And for some reason, you've heard the number of financial analysts believe that at a future time, let's say in one month, two months, or six months, let's say at time T, the value of the stock ST should be equal to K, and K is greater than S0. So of course, you should wait and uh, let's say uh, sell your stock at uh, time T. Uh, of course, you cannot be completely sure that the value of the stock will be greater than S0. It could be indeed lower than ST. So from a financial point of view, we would be very happy if, they are ex if we can find a product uh, which is going to give you something like an insurance product, which is going to guarantee that you will get exactly the uh, value K. These kind of products are called uh, options, and uh, more precisely here, uh, this is a put option with strike price K and maturity T. So uh, for this option, the value at time T or the payoff when ST, the value of the stock at time T is known, is equal to the maximum between K minus ST and zero. So if K is greater than T, uh, sorry, if K is greater than ST, the seller of the puts will pay you K minus ST. And of course, if K is lower than ST, the seller will pay you nothing. This means that when now you decide at time zero to buy the put, you get a portfolio of financial securities, you get one stock and you get one put. And when we compute the value pi of the portfolio at time T, it is equal to pi of T uh, which is the sum of the stock value and the, the, the value of the put option ST plus VT. So now if ST is lower than K, pi of T is equal to K. If ST is greater than K, pi of T is equal to ST. And because of the put option, the value of your portfolio is always greater than K. So this is the main interest of the puts. And now what we want to do is to try to compute the value at time zero of the put option within the Black-Scholes model. So uh, the Black-Scholes model is a continuous time model. And actually something that I'm going to show you, the rate of return between uh, time t and time t plus dt is stochastic. But before I consider uh, the, uh, the risky asset, I'm going to consider the riskless asset. So a riskless asset, this is something very simple because there is no risk at all. So assume for instance that R, which is the interest rate, which can be thought of as the interest rate that you earn when you put a given amount of money in your bank. And let me assume that uh, you put a value equal to BT. So within a time interval DT, it is assumed that the rate of return is proportional to dt. This means that your rate of return defined as dbt divided by bt is equal to rdt, where dbt is b of uh, t plus dt minus bt. And this defines an elementary ordinary differential equation whose solution is an exponential function. Okay, more complex is the way we can model the stock. The stock is a risky asset and there should be something like a random component. So the rate of return of the stock within a time interval dt is equal to dst divided by st, which is the rate of return, which is equal to mu dt plus sigma times something which is a noise. And the noise actually is the increment of a Brownian motion uh, written dw2. This kind of equation is called a stochastic differential equation, of course, because beyond the term mu dt, we get a stochastic term, which is sigma dw2. So w uh, is called a Brownian motion, 
and DW2 is the increment of the Brownian motion in uh, or within a time interval dt. So actually, uh, the Brownian motion W uh, is a, a family of random variable indexed by time. The time is continuous, and we say that this is a continuous time uh, stochastic process. So few things about the Brownian motion. So when we look a burning motion, more generally a stochastic process in continuous time, we have two types of distribution of properties. We have the distributional properties of the burning motion, which refers, for instance, to the uh, probabilistic aspect of the increment, let's say, uh, wt plus h minus wt. From a probabilistic point of view, what can be said about this? Actually, I'm going to show you that this is simply a Gaussian distribution. And we have the more difficult properties, which are called the sample path properties of W. And the sample path properties refers to the regularity of the sample path of W. So for instance, uh, uh, can we claim that a typical sample path of the Brownian motion is a continuous function of time? Is it differentiable? And what can be said, for instance, about something that is called the quadratic variation? I'm not going to discuss about the definition, I give below, but you should know that if you take, for instance, uh, a classical function with bounded derivatives, the quadratic variation of that function is equal to zero. And it turns out that this is not the case for the Brownian motion precisely because the Brownian motion is not differentiable. So uh, when we look at the increment of the Brownian motion, wt plus h minus wt, this follows a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and with variance h, meaning that if you compute the expectation of the increment, the expectation of the increment is equal to zero and uh, the standard deviation is equal to the square root of h. And for that reason, the Brownian motion, which has also a independent increment over time, we say that W is a Gaussian random walk, which can be thought of as uh, the continuous time version of the random walk that you've seen in your course, Convergence, Integration, and Probability. So this is, um, this is an example of a sample path of a Brownian motion where we can see that uh, if we look at this sample path, it is a continuous function of time. So now to get uh, to better understand the stochastic differential equation, if you, if you consider a simple discretization of this uh, SDE, you get uh, ST plus H minus ST divided by ST, which is the rate of return within a time interval H, which is equal to mu H plus sigma, the square root of H Z, where this Z is a, a Gaussian random variable. And of course, when we make the computation of uh, this rate of return, we get mu h because the expectation of z is equal to zero. And of course, we expect in general that mu is going to be greater than r. Why? Because there's a positive volatility, sigma, and the positive volatility makes this investment riskier. And in general, for this, you need a, a risk premium. So now, if, I'm, if we write new as the uh, air, which is the rate of return of a riskless investment plus a, a risk premium, we see that uh, if we now consider the case in which sigma is equal to zero, nobody we would like uh, to invest in the riskless assets. Of course, why? Because if sigma is equal to zero, you get two choice. Uh, air, a rate of return of air with priority one, or a rate of return of mu with priority one. If mu is greater than r, nobody would like to invest in the, in the riskless asset. And this would create something that in finance we call an arbitrage opportunity. So, so far uh, in, the, uh, in the black Scholes model, we get two time of dynamics. We get the dynamics for the riskless asset, which follows an ordinary differential equation. And we get the dynamics for the risky asset, which is a stochastic differential equation. So as you probably may know, when we consider insurance and finance, there are many ways to value products. One of them is diversification. 
it means that you are going to pull independent risk. This is the field of insurance, but of course here it makes no sense. So in finance, we are going to consider something which is different, which is related to edging. Edging means annihilate the risk, something that I'm going to explain. So recall that the aim is to find V0 within the Black-Scholes model. So let me assume that we start with a portfolio whose value at time t is equal to pi of t, which is equal to Vt plus delta st. Delta is the number of stocks uh, that you get. And actually, because there are only positive signs, you get a, a long position on the stock, but also on the option. So now what we want to do is to compute the increment of the portfolio pi within a time interval dt. So for this, uh, we need a mathematical tool known as Itos Lemma, which is roughly speaking, nothing more than a Terra expansion with an extra term. So if we compute uh, the uh, increment of the portfolio pi, d pi, d pi is equal to dv plus delta ds. But since ds uh, uh, comprise a term in dw, where dw is the increment of the Brownian motion, we get two times of terms. Of course, we get dt terms, but we also get uh, terms in dw. And of course, this means that d pi, the increment of the portfolio, is stochastic. So let me now assume that delta is equal to minus the partial, the partial derivatives of v with respect to s. If we replug this in the increment d pi of the portfolio, we get something in which uh, we get the increment d pi which involves only DT terms. So by doing this, we killed not only the stochastic part of the increment of the portfolio in DW, in DW, this is something which is called the edging, and we also kill the mu terms. And as a result, we get something uh, which is a riskless portfolio. But if the portfolio is riskless, this means that it should be compensated at the risk-free rate, and we get d pi, which is equal to r pi dt. So if you replug the relevant formula, uh, you get uh, you get uh, the term in uh, dt, which is the increment of the portfolio, times r, times the value of the portfolio, which is v minus delta s, but since delta is equal to the, the minus the partial derivative of v was equal to s, we get r times v minus the derivative of v was respect to s times s times dt. So now if we put the term together, we get uh, the Black-Scholes PD uh, given here. And of course, to value now the put option, we apply the relevant boundary condition given by vt, which is the maximum between k minus st, and zero. Few remarks about this partial differential equation. Of course, uh, since we killed uh, by uh, choosing delta equal to minus the partial derivative of v with respect to s, the PDE is independent of mu, but critically depends on the volatility sigma. So we have a, a second order terms, and actually the second order terms comes from Ito's lemma, which in turn comes from the quadratic variation of the Brownian motion. So uh, I told you that if you compute the quadratic variation of a regular function, this is equal to zero. It turns out that because of the properties of the Brownian motion, which is uh, almost surely nowhere differentiable, the quadratic variation on zero t of the Brownian motion is equal to t. And this is why we get a second order term which means that overall we get a linear parabolic partial differential equation. So this is the, the, the classical solution uh, of the uh, PD uh, of the Black-Scholes PD given for a put option that I'm not going to discuss. Let me conclude by, by, by uh, something which is important. Uh, the, the conclusion could be as follows. Is Black-Scholes formula the end of the story? And the answer is no. Black-Scholes is only the beginning of the story. Why? Because in the Black-Scholes model, we make a fairly strong assumption 
in which the volatility sigma is constant. And actually, when we look at data, data suggests that the volatility is not constant. For instance, the volatility itself could be stochastic, and it could be possible to model the volatility also as a, a stochastic process. So actually, in the banking industry, the Black-Scholes formula is not used to value an option, but given the price of the option, it is used to imply the volatility. And let me conclude with a joke. So uh, the implied volatility can be thought of as the wrong number to plug in the wrong formula to get the right answer. Jan, thank you so much for such uh, interesting insights. No pun intended, of course. And uh, students, we will be uh, seeing you uh, with chapter three coming up next, and that will be about distributions and Sobolev spaces.